Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is James Clark, and I'm a station commander in the UK Fire and Rescue Service. Throughout my 23 years in the fire service, I've been fortunate enough to be involved in some amazing projects, one of which has been the introduction of post-fire decontamination to the fire service. For me personally, this was more than just carrying out my duties. This was deeply personal. I come from a fire service family. My grandfather, my father, and my cousins have all served in the fire service. And in 2008, my father was diagnosed with cancer of the larynx. After finding out about my father's cancer, I became aware of a lot more firefighters being diagnosed with cancer and the reality of the cancer problem within the fire and rescue service. A close friend of mine, two days away from retirement, was diagnosed with testicular cancer and two colleagues on another station lost their wives to cancer. We think it's probably from cross-contamination. The problem is real and it's probably the single biggest threat outside of mental health to the fire service community worldwide. And I'm grateful that today it has been given this platform to be discussed. Education is the best prevention. And if you can take one thing away from this presentation that will change the culture in this industry, that will be one step closer to reducing occupational cancer. So what is cancer? Cancer is more than 100 related diseases that stem from a genetic change at a cellular level. In all types of cancer, some of the cells begin to divide without stopping and spread into the surrounding tissues. This process can start anywhere in the human body. Cancer can result from damage to DNA caused by certain environmental exposures, and these exposures will include the toxins that firefighters are continually exposed to at incidents. There has been countless studies worldwide, and they all reach the same conclusion, whether it's one in two, two in four, four times more likely. The fact is, you are more likely to get cancer as a firefighter than the general public. And then what's compounded by that is the mortality rate of cancer in firefighters is greater than the average person. So, cancer is the most dangerous, unrecognized threat to the health and safety of emergency response workers. It's the number one cause of firefighter deaths according to the International Association of Firefighters. So what is a carcinogen? A carcinogen is any substance capable of causing cancer. Carcinogens can occur naturally in the environment, such as through ultraviolet rays in sunlight and in certain viruses, or may be generated by humans, such as within automobile exhaust fumes and smoke. Most carcinogens will work by interacting with the cell's DNA to produce mutations. Carcinogens will enter the body either via ingestion, inhalation, or absorption, and via ultrafine particles. So, what is an ultrafine particle? Ultrafine particles are the smallest group of particulates in the atmosphere. They are generated in high temperature processes, such as combustion processes within fires, wood fires, industrial processes, in aspirated oils, in vehicle engines, and as most commonly everybody will know, within cigarette smoke. You can see from the picture just exactly how small it is. And if you compare the size of the largest particulate to the smallest particulate, you can see it against the diameter of the human hair. The green, which is in the blue circle, is how small it is, smaller than the grain of sand. Today's modern methods of construction have increased the carcinogens around us and in fire situations have increased the exposure rate. This combined with fire retardant coatings, plastic products, modern furniture has put firefighters more at risk. Carcinogens that are present on the incident ground include polycylic aromatic hydrocarbons, PAHs, benzene, diesel exhaust fumes, chromium, formaldehyde, PFAS in firefighting foams, and asbestos fibers. Absorption, inhalation, and ingestion are the primary ways that firefighters will be exposed to carcinogen. And the risk from those carcinogens will always be there until the contaminant is removed. As I mentioned earlier, there have been countless studies worldwide, and they all reach the same conclusion. And worldwide, over 50 studies have been carried out. In the UK, we were able to demonstrate the significant correlation between firefighting cancers 
of, between firefighting and cancers of the prostate, leukemia, colon, and throat cancers. So back in 2015, so getting on for almost 10 years now, the IAFF funded screening tests. And this was to demonstrate the effect of ultrafine particles on, on a firefighter. A firefighter was dressed in full PPE and was placed in a testing chamber. This chamber was set at 70 degrees Fahrenheit with 50% relative humidity and a 10 mile an hour wind. And whilst you can see the smoke, those particulates as they're so small and have a dilemma less than a fraction of a micron, it's no wonder how these particulates were able to get through the skin and, or get through the clothing and then rest on the skin. So if you see from the picture, the lower front torso shows moderate to heavy ultrafine particulate deposits. The location and the pattern suggest that there was infiltration between the leggings and the tunic. The bright spots that are on the hand are probably through two ways. One is the interface between the gloves and the tunic, or possibly from due to cross-contamination when removing PPE, which we'll touch on slightly later. These photos show the heavy deposits around the neck, the jawline, the ears, and the hair. And this is due to penetration through the flash hood. The dark band that is just below the ears, which is relatively clean, shows the areas where the mask strap was tight. This test proves that the toxins are reaching the skin through PPE. On this picture, where you can see the deposits that are on the legs, the pattern suggests that the infiltration was through the boot and legging um, overlap and possible uh, penetration through the fabric of the leggings. Deposits that were around the waist are through the infiltration between the tunic and the leggings interface. All of these photos show that there is a significant impact to the skin of a firefighter during exposure. If we think back to my earlier slides that highlighted where the predominant cancers occur, this confirms that prostate, thyroid, neck, throat, and brain cancers are caused via this method. I'd like to point out again that this was back in 2015 and people were trying to raise the awareness of occupational cancer to firefighters and it's taken till now for official recognition. On the 1st of July 2022, the World Health Organization International Agency for Research on Cancer officially changed the status of firefighting as a profession from Group 2B, possibly carcinogenic, to a Group 1 carcinogenic to humans. And that statement's pretty powerful, is that firefighting is a carcinogenic profession. It's far from a surprising development to those that have monitored this situation carefully. And academic research that's been over the last 10 years has informed us that these dangers are there, and exposure to post-fire contaminants, and particularly the issue around dermal absorption. So we understand now that there's a horrific magnitude of the occupation of cancer problem. And we're not going to eradicate cancer in the fire service, but we can take steps to reduce the exposure, which will in turn reduce the levels of occupational cancer within the fire service. We can't stop going to fires. And with dermal absorption, now a proven route for contamination, it's important to understand how we best mitigate the risk. And this is where it gets challenging. The role of a firefighter is to fight fire. Non-exposure is not an option. And once contaminated, the knock-on effect is considerable, especially when research proves that body temperature will increase the rate of absorption by up to five times. But it's just not municipal firefighters who are exposed to the risk. During training, the incidents, it's important to remember that if you smell smoke, you're being exposed. Natural vegetation fires, Wildfires, vehicle heavy plant fires, live fire training, diesel and exhaust fumes, drivers and engineers performing non-operational duties, crews assigned to external firefighting, people on aviation grounds, oil and gas industry, and it, the list goes on and on and on. When personnel are exposed to environments that can potentially contaminate them, their clothing and equipment, the presumption should always be they are contaminated. And this includes any duration of time, even after the event when there is no exposure, when you think there's no exposure, for example, when you were talking maybe 
crime scene investigators, medical teams, salvage operations, fire investigators, utility companies, aviation industry, and military. So for an organisation to be as effective as possible and to reduce the risk to their colleagues and families from cross-contamination, they must stop the contaminants leaving the, the, the scene. So if I ask now, has anybody got a policy which involves post-fire decontamination? That's great to see. It's great to see. And for your organisation, is it implemented? Yes. That's amazing. It's fairly new. Fairly new. Yeah. It's brilliant. So it's, it's important for us to understand that we break the chain. So how do we break the chain? And a simple starting point to begin culture change. You should be familiar, or hopefully you may be familiar, with the hot, warm, cold zone process. If you think of the hot zone as a major area for exposure and contamination, and then moving on to the warm zone, where contamination can initially be reduced through removing PPE, using wipes, cleaning equipment and personnel, along with the bagging up of PPE, and then moving into the cold zone where rehab, rehydration and medical monitoring can occur. However, we have to remember that the cold zone does not mean clean. The cold zone just means it's removed from the initial contamination and cross-contamination can occur and we can't consider personnel or equipment to be fully contaminated. On an ideal world, on return to station, there will be defined areas so you'd be able to move on a one-way route through a station, keeping the contaminated equipment, personnel, away from clean areas until they can be fully decontaminated. Until we reach that world, how do we reduce the risk? As I said previously, culture change is the biggest step. Strategic sponsorship of post-incident decontamination has to be the front of any change. As fire industry leaders, it's your responsibility to reduce this risk. The results that were in the previous slides only reinforce the need to implement post-decon procedures. Within the UK, shower within the hour has become the mantra following every incident, and it's a simple culture change which is proving very effective. As soon as you finish an incident, firefighters will shower as soon as possible within the hour and rid themselves, their hair, their body of the harmful toxins before they have their chance to absorb, or even worse, cross-contaminate and take them home. The days of a dirty fire kit being a badge of honour are quite rightly rapidly becoming a thing of the past. Access to clean workwear, firefighting PPE, must become more prevalent along with new routines for personal washing and decontamination of equipment post-incident. It's a powerful statement there that we can't change the exposure of the past, but we can change how we protect ourselves for the future. I said at the beginning of the presentation, if there's one thing that we can take from this, or there's one thing that you can take from this, we'll be one step closer to reducing occupational cancer within the workplace. Can I ask you if there is one thing that you'll be able to take from this presentation that you just raise your hand for me? Thank you.